Her triumphs, I took a group of women that didn't believe in themselves and I just believed in them. Her trials. I never wanted to go to practice. I was losing a ton of weight. Her story. I just put my faith in God and just trusted the system. Her why. I want people to see what I did and say, oh, that's so awesome. I'm gonna be better than that. That would be how I hope that this journey ends. This is Her Why, where we tell the stories from BYU women's sports. Here is your host, Lauren McLean. Today's guest is BYU women's tennis head coach, Holly Hassler, who started her career at BYU as a freshman before joining the pro circuit. In the year 2000, she was ranked 83rd in the WTA's top 100, and now over 20 years later, she's come full circle coaching at her alma mater. Holly, thank you so much for coming here with me. Absolutely. I'm excited to be here. What what comes to your mind when you hear 20 years later, over 20 years later? What comes to mind? You know, I'm feeling very old. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, when I was the assistant coach, people had a hard time differentiating if I was a player or a coach. Mm -hmm. And yesterday I was in the gym with the girls and one of the athletes walked up to me and said, do you mind signing this bench over, coach? And I thought to myself... I don't look like one of the girls or players anymore. I'm old now. <laughs> no, you look really, really young. Did you ever think you would end up back at BYU after all those years uh, coaching? Was that ever something you thought about? Um, it was definitely something, definitely not in my mind when I was a player yeah. at all. Yeah. Don't think I ever went there in my mind. Um, but as I got out on the tour and then started realizing that I didn't have a degree, I thought maybe coaching is going to be the next best best thing for me. Um, and so I, I came back as the assistant, and then I took a 10-year break and had kids. And, you know, I don't think during that break I ever thought I would come back as the head coach. It was, mm -hmm. it was not in my plans at all. So so what, what kind of made that transition for you uh, into that position? Um, I'm really deeply connected in the tennis community. Um, just here in Utah because my kids play mm -hmm. and so I never it's not like I ever left tennis but um, I taught a lot of the top juniors and so um, and then just growing up my whole life in tennis and being LDS I just being very deeply rooted I think the day that the head coach left I probably got 25 text messages on my phone did you hear did you hear I'm well I've heard now yeah. and uh, what are you going to do? I, I don't know. What are you talking about? Yeah. And so I think a lot of other people probably had it in their mind right. before um, it was in my mind. But um, but everything worked out. And I mean, I'm so excited to be back and to be here. And honestly, it's been a wild ride, but just so fulfilling. Incredible. And I think the girls are so lucky to have you. You've played at Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, the Australian Open and the French Open. Do they understand that? Do the girls you coach, do they know how successful you were as a pro player? Um, I think that most of them do. Uh, you know, the game of tennis has changed so much. I feel like the collegiate level now is NCAA Division I is the same level as professional tennis, which it wasn't like that, um, you know, 25 years ago. It definitely wasn't the same. Um, but I do use that as a recruiting tool to try to bring in players. You know, I try to help them to understand that college is a great pathway for the professional tour and that I have been there. So I know what it takes to, to be great and to work hard and to get to that next level. And I mean, I like to bring in girls that have goals set on their sites for playing pro because I think it's just something that every little girl dreams of and it's you know it's it's fun to be able to help them to accomplish those goals right so do you uh do you ever tell them stories of like oh when I was playing so and so and uh do you ever do you ever sit down with your players and tell them stories of your past oh yeah absolutely I mean I always um it's just it's so great to teach through experience and I think that's one of the things that helps me to kind of connect and relate with the girls is I can say hey I know how you're feeling right now. When I played in the finals of this tournament, I was down this and this, and I just thought to myself, I'm going to make 10 balls every single rally. And, you know, and I'm like, that's where you're at right now. Just focus on the process, focus on the plan. And, and it, it is really nice to be able to share experiences and 
recently on a flight, I pulled up one of my matches from the U.S. Open on my computer. I had just gotten it downloaded from VHS onto <laughs> di- digital Those format. And so it was on my desktop and the, one of the players next to me said, wait, what is that? And so we started watching some of my match from center court at the wow. U.S. Open. And oh then gosh. everybody was up over the seats and, you know, looking down and we were just laughing at some of the things that I did. And it was fun. Oh, my gosh. How cool is that? Yeah. I think that's just an incredible thing. So you, like we mentioned, you played one season, then you turned pro. So was turning professional always in the back of your mind of what you wanted to do? Um, Yes. From the time I was probably, I'd say 12, I knew that I wanted to play professional. Um, I always did want to play college, though, as well. Um, I felt like I could really benefit and learn. One of the nice things about college is because you can have a coach on the court, um, you don't get that in junior tennis, which is crazy because yeah. they, they give you coaching in college and they give you coaching in the pros, but not in junior tennis. And it's just such a great way to learn um, and to strategize and to help with the mental side when you can have someone there kind of from the outside looking in. And um, so college was always in my goals as well. My initial plan um, was always to attend two years of school and then try to hit the tour. Um But I had a really successful freshman year, Mm -hmm. and I decided on the side I was going to play a bunch of pro tournaments throughout college just to kind of get my foot in the door and see how I did. And that summer after my freshman year, I kind of got in a zone, and I went to a few pro tournaments, and I was unstoppable. I qualified and won the first two tournaments and qualified and finished second at the third, and By the end of the summer, I had a wild card into the U.S. Open, and I was top 300 in the world. And so when I got to the U.S. Open, you have to decide if you're going to sign in as an amateur or sign in as a pro. And that's where I kind of had to make my decision. And I just thought, you know, this would be a nice chunk of change to Mm -hmm. get me started. And the way that it works is your ranking points fall off each year. And so... I was already top 300 and could start getting into the main draw of events. And if I waited another year, those ranking points would drop off and I'd kind of start back from square one. And so I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to give this a shot. And now looking back, how do you feel about that decision that you made? Um, Honestly, I don't have any regrets. Um, It was an amazing experience. I do feel like people don't realize the grind that it is. I don't even think I realized the grind, but um, I was traveling about 35 weeks out of the year, 35 to 40 weeks out of the year. And you're just really living out of a suitcase. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you go down to South America and Europe, you can't just go for one tournament. You're pretty much there for four or five uh, to make it worth the trip. And so if you lose first round, you sit around all week and watch everyone else play and you've got to be motivated to get in the gym and get out and practice and train and get ready for the next week. And so it's it's definitely not um, as glamorous of a lifestyle, I think, as everybody um, might imagine in their minds. But then when you get to the Grand Slams and you work your way in, then you, you get there and you're treated like kings and queens mm-hmm. and you realize, oh, this is... This is what it's all about. This is why I've, you know, worked my butt off my whole life. And and so, um, you know, I don't I don't have any regrets. I learned so much. I became so independent um, and I just fulfilled my dream. And after five or six years, I struggled with a few injuries and just kind of got burned out a little bit. Yeah. It can be a lonely lifestyle out there. Um, and. Uh, Amazing things happened. The I, I volunteered at BYU as the volunteer assistant for a season, and then the the position opened after that season mm-hmm. of volunteering, and so it was kind of just like, wow, maybe this is meant to be. Yeah, I can roll right into the assistant coach position and get a feel for college tennis, you know, on the coaching side. And I mean, I feel like it is the next best thing to being out there playing on the tour because you still get to be competitive and it's just through somebody else's eyes and then to be able to just see others succeed and accomplish their dreams and just help them get through hard times it's like wow this is really fulfilling it's awesome I love it 
When you you said it's the next best thing to playing, are you ever when you're watching some of your girls play? Sometimes are you like, all right, give me the racket, let me show you how it's done. Oh man, sometimes <laughs> I wish so badly I could just jump into their body. I mean, just I mean, there's nothing better than being able to play, yeah. you know, at such a high level and competitively. And I am really competitive, so I love competing mm -hmm. and just fighting and sometimes when I get out there with the girls I mean they've all seen my competitive side it, it just still comes out you know and um, and I do I wish sometimes that I could just jump into their body because they make it harder than it needs to be yeah. sometimes <laughs> with their minds um, you know and I've been there and so it's 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 tough being on the sidelines sometimes but it's also just nice to know that I can be there to help and support. And you mentioned that it was a little tough on your body. You experienced a couple injuries. What were those injuries during your pro career? Um, you know, I had a couple of just reoccurring injuries that were just subtle but never really went away. I had a really odd dead arm oh, where wow. my right arm would just, I think baseball players get it a lot, it would kind of just go dead where I felt like I couldn't hold the racket. I'd have wow. to quickly switch it into my other hand. Um, and just never really figured out what it was, but it was just always in a nuisance. Um, and then in my last year on tour, I was playing in a pro tournament down in Arizona, and I was running back for a deep ball, and I slipped on a few leaves in the back of the court and fell and broke my wrist. Oh, my gosh. And so um, that was a lingering injury for a while, just coming back. Um, it just kept flaring up and hurting even after I got my cast off and everything. And... Um, then I just had a papatia strain behind my knee that was just kind of reoccurring all the time. I still feel it today when oh I drive. Gosh. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so, you know, just little things, but I mean, that's just part of being an athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, you play through mm -hmm. injuries all the time and, um, I think it's just part of being mentally tough, you know, is just learning how to kind of play through pain and get out there and just know that something's always going to hurt when you put your body <laughs> at that stress level. Um, so it definitely wasn't the reason that I decided to, to end my career. Um, it was probably more so the fact that I just wanted to settle down and have a family, get married. I'm like, I'm never going to meet anybody. I'm never going to get married <laughs> just cause I'm just, you know, never, I don't have a ward. I've never have a calling. Yeah. I'm just kind of in and out of a suitcase and ward hopping all the time from place to place. And and so I think it was more so just, I'm ready to settle down, yeah. you know. How did you end up meeting your husband after all that? So we actually, during one of my injuries, um, my family had moved to Utah. And so I was kind of coming back in between tournaments and injuries to Utah now instead of Texas, which is where I grew up playing. And oddly enough, we um, I attended my aunt's baby blessing uh, while I was home, and he was attending his sister's baby blessing. Oh, wow. And so I saw him go up and assist in the blessing. And I said to my sisters that were next to me, wow, he's really cute. We should find <laughs> out who he is. And, and so we went back and we asked my aunt. And it turns out they visit taught each other and were neighbors. And unfortunately, at that time, he was dating someone pretty seriously and close to being engaged. And mm -hmm. so she just said, dang, it's probably not going to work, you know. And But then about... Probably like six or seven months later, she texted me and said, I have great news. My neighbor's <laughs> brother broke up with his girlfriend. So next time you're in town, I'll set you guys up. And so she did. She set us up. We went on a blind date, kind of a blind date because he didn't know who I was, but I kind of knew who he was and had seen him. And and we went to a haunted house and uh, just hit it off and oh my gosh. yeah I mean it was crazy how it all just kind of worked out so and four kids later right yep. four kids later here we are that's right amazing yep. let's go back a little bit and by back a little bit I mean let's go way back you mentioned when you were 12 is when you decided you want to become pro so you moved to Florida without your family when you were young so you could play tennis year-round at a tennis academy what was that like for you um I mean at the time it was just my dream come true because I just wanted to play tennis all day, every day. And at that time, my family lived in New Jersey. We moved around a lot because my dad was in the Army. And um, New Jersey was cold in the winters and only had indoor courts. And it was just really hard finding court time and getting enough hours in with school and everything. And um, so we had heard about a few tennis academies down in Florida. And there were a couple other kids from up on the East Coast that 
had gone down there as well. And so we did know one of the coaches. And so it kind of started out with me going back and forth from home, just visiting for two weeks at a time or so. And um, then I just felt like it was what I needed to do full time if I wanted to um, to be on the path that I needed to be on to eventually turn pro. And so I did. I moved down there and I was there for all of seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th grades. Wow. And I just lived in an apartment with four or five other girls. We had a house parent, one of their moms that lived with us and took care of us. And um, the schedule was uh, school, 7 to 9 a.m. in a trailer behind the tennis courts. And then we had tennis from ni- tennis and conditioning from 9 to 4. And then we were back in the trailer from 4 to 7 for wow. the rest of our classes. And then we'd come out and go into a different trailer for dinner at 7 o'clock. And then we were home by 8 and getting ready for bed and and that was five days a week. Yeah. And we had tournaments on weekends. And um, I had six other siblings. And so my, my, my parents just had their hands full. And it was just none of them, nobody else played tennis in my family. And so I was kind of on my own. But um, I flew home once a month. And my parents came out probably once a month. And they came to my tournaments. And um, so it was a lot of back and forth. And at that time, there wasn't really cell phones. Yeah. And so we were writing letters. I mean, I have just stacks and stacks of letters that I would write back and forth with my parents and my siblings. I mean, it's crazy. Nowadays, you know, communication's a lot easier. That Was that so hard being away from your family at such a young age? Um, or were you just so driven in tennis that you're like, this is what I want to do? You know, do I think I was just so driven that it wasn't. Um, but I also, I mean, my roommates and friends at the academy were like my second family. And... They, I don't know. I mean, they were like my best friends. And I mean, I went to church down there. And so I was part of the young women and the church leaders were so great about just giving me rides and helping me to feel included. So I just kind of felt like I had a pretty good support system down there and um, and still just made plenty of time for, for going home and family trips. Yeah. And um, I mean, I had a really close relationship with my siblings and so... Um, it just, it did, it just worked pretty well. So you were kind of living a dream a little bit. But um, I did move home my my um, my junior and senior year. My family moved to Texas. My dad got out of the Army, and he was an orthopedic surgeon, so he started his own private practice and went to Texas so that my little sister that was a gymnast and myself could live at home. Um, he kind of tried to find a place where both of those sports were really wow. strong. And so I moved home, and we were in a great area. I got everything I needed tennis-wise, um, and I, I did go to a public high school there. I only went from 8 to 11 every day, but, but um, I mean, it was a great experience. But I think, you know, being great at anything, you just have to make sacrifices. Yeah. Um, I went to senior prom, and that was really fun. Um, I did miss my high school graduation, but I was in the finals of a pro tournament. So <laughs> priorities, just, you know, priorities. So, um, it's, yeah, it sounds like your parents had to make a lot of sacrifices for you and, and your sister. It sounds like to be able to do what you guys love. Was it something they pushed you to do at a young age? Like how, how involved were your parents in your decision to pursue tennis? Um, I think to be great at anything like that, you have to have push from yeah. your parents. Um, yeah, my dad pushed me a lot. I mean, he was Army, mm. so he was hardcore. Um, but looking back, I'm like, I never would have been as, as good as I was or had the drive that I did without him. Um, when we lived in New Jersey, he would come down to my bedroom every morning at 545. Let's get up. It's time for tennis. And, um, you know, just find ways to get me out of bed. And, you know, now I've kind of done the same with my kids and pushed them. And But then it comes to a point where you see that they love it for themselves. And then it's like, oh, I'm so happy. I can see now that, like, like I pushed them just enough, but now they want it for themselves. Yes. And then it's it's fun to see them just take off. And I feel like that's kind of how it was for me. For a time, I was pushed. There were times I didn't want to get up. There were times I just maybe wanted to do something else. And, and I was pushed and pushed. And then it got to the point where I was like, wow, like I can be I can be really great at this. And I love it for myself. And I'm out here playing because I want to be out here. 
And um, and so I, I think it you really need it need that push initially from, from one or both of, of your parents. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to be with BYU women's head tennis coach Holly Hassler. We're here with BYU women's head tennis coach Holly Hassler, and we're continuing our conversation. Holly, you were the number one high school recruit in the country, and you could have chosen to go anywhere, and you chose BYU. I'm assuming that had something to do with your faith, but what was going through your mind when you made that choice? Um, you know, definitely a lot of things. It, I can remember back to it feeling like such a huge um, pressuring decision that took a lot of prayer and a lot of thought. Um, you know, my whole life I dreamed of being a Florida Gator, actually, wow. not a BYU Cougar. <laughs> um, I spent almost every summer at the BYU, um, not the BYU, the University of Florida um, women's tennis camp every summer. I would leave my academy and go down there and train with the coaches. And um, I just, they were the number one school at that time, number one um, team, best coaches, amazing facilities. And I just, my whole life, just that that was my dream was to be a Florida Gator and play at the best school in the country. Um, and then as it got time for my decision, I started taking recruiting trips and um, I took a visit out here to BYU and I took a visit to Florida and a few other schools. And, you know, it was really eye opening for me um, just to experience just some of the atmosphere outside of tennis at some of the other schools that was um, you know, I kind of grew up sheltered at the academies and was just on my own little schedule where I went to bed early and focused on tennis. And um, I mean, I remember when I went to Florida, they knew that I, you know, was a member of the church and that I had high high standards and and that I visited, you know, went to visit the Institute. But then at night they took me to these huge college parties. And I can remember just crazy things that were <laughs> happening. And I, I went back to my hotel room and just cried and just mm -hmm. thought, you know, what if I came here and I had an injury yeah. or something happened and I couldn't play tennis, would I be happy? Yeah. And I just thought, I want to be happy on the court, but I also want to be happy off the court. Mm. And I think that was probably one of the most deciding factors was just the atmosphere um, that I just fell in love with here at BYU. And um, the other thing, too, was I knew I wanted to go pro in Florida and Stanford and Texas, they were so good that even though I was the top recruit in the country, I knew that going into those schools, I'd have great practice partners. But my first year or two years, I was going to play five or six in the lineup yeah. because they were so good. Um, and I knew if I came to BYU, I would play number one. <laughs> and I just thought, would I rather play five and six and have great practice partners every day but maybe not get that great of match play because we're so strong and I'm playing down at the bottom and not have the opportunity for the top tournaments like the NCAAs? Or would I rather play number one and play against all the very best girls in the country mm -hmm. and have the opportunity to be nationally ranked, play in all the individual national tournaments that only usually the number one and maybe number two players get to have the opportunity at playing? And um, and it ended up just being so clear in my mind that BYU was the place where I needed to go, um, just not only to prepare me for the tennis tour, but just to prepare me for life. And it was a, probably one of the best decisions I ever made. And even though it was only a year, I loved going out on the tour and being known as Holly Parkinson from BYU <laughs> because everybody knew what I stood for and that I was a member of the church. And I just... I don't know. I just loved it. I loved representing BYU even after I left. Oh, that's so cool. And like you mentioned, you had a stellar freshman year. You you were phenomenal enough so that you're like, okay, well, I'm going to go pro. And you talked about that a little bit. I want to know what were your feelings when you played in your very first professional match? You know, starting out professionally is, I think it's a little different than other sports because Anybody that tries to start out professionally, there's a whole field of 
college players, junior players, that they're all trying to break through Mm -hmm. and break in. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't really feel that much different than, um, than any other tournament. But when you make it into the main draw of a Grand Slam, that's when it felt crazy. <laughs> like, is this really happening? Am I really here? Wow, how did I even get here? I mean, it's just... And then the nerves, they kick in, and they, they run pretty high. And... Um, But, you know, overall, I just always felt gratitude, just so grateful. I'm like, wow, I feel so blessed just to have this opportunity. Um, And, you know, I tried to just just think of it as a process, you know, match by match, point by point, and just kind of focus on me and my plan and not worry too much about who or who's on the other side of the net or who's in the stands and um, and I think that, that that was always really helpful for me to just keep my mind clear and to just focus on um, just the process. It would be a difficult thing to do, though. There, there's so many components, like you mentioned. You played Anna Kornikova at the U.S. Open in 2000. You were under the lights at Arthur Ashe Stadium. You lost the straight set 6-2, 6-3. But what was it like playing against an opponent like that, someone so famous in one of the biggest stages in tennis? Oh, that match was, that was a tough one. It was really my first time to play in front of so many people. Um, It was nearly sold out. There were about 25,000 people there. And playing against Kornikova was hard because although I was the American at the U.S. Open, um, she was a teenage phenom that was just kind of known for her because she was a model and, you know, her, her beauty and... And so that factor kind of played into it as well. And, I mean, people were screaming out things to her. And, um, and so it was, it was tough. It was hard to focus. As a matter of fact, um, I, I didn't play super well. Um, at, I, I started to relax in the second set and actually got a lead and was up, I think, 3-1, 40-15. And I still remember it pretty clearly. And then I just got nervous. Mm. I think I just started focusing too much on, whoa, I'm up, you know, against one of the top seeds. I'm on center court in the U.S. Open and, <laughs> and you know, kind of just got nervous and played nervous and just didn't really execute the way that I, I hoped that I could. Um, but, you know, I learned a lot from it and it was a great, I mean, great opportunity, great experience. And, you know, I tried to just with big matches like that, just take what I could learn and just use it to improve and get better. Um, I remember before one point, you know, everybody was screaming for her the entire time. And before one point that I served, somebody yelled out, we love you, Holly. (laughs) And I remember just stopping and just smiling and just kind of, oh, that was nice. You know, (laughs) somebody's cheering for me up there. Um, But no, I mean, it was... It was fun, just all a part of the experience. Oh, so, man, that sounds absolutely crazy. You're like, somebody loves me up there. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, that that probably wasn't your favorite moment as your of your pro career. But what, well, looking back, what sticks out in your mind as your best memory of your time as a pro? You know, I would say, other than just learning like hard work and what it really means, probably the people and the relationships, just all the friends. Um, It's so nice being the head coach now because I just have a lot of connections with foreigners and international previous players and coaches and um, just lifelong friends, you know. I mean, it's it's kind of fun to just still feel like that community is still present today. You know, we still stay in touch and it's nice to have social media Mm. where we can reconnect and, um, and yeah, I mean, just the opportunity to be around so many people, not of my faith and just have such good lifelong friends that, you know, we're all trying to achieve the same goal and now we're married and a lot of us have kids and are teaching our kids and, um, And so, yeah, just the relationships. I mean, just coaches and players. And it's so fun to battle on court. And then 10 minutes later, it's like, 
your best friends again, yeah. you know, <laughs> pushing each other on the practice court and helping each other to get better. And I, that's one of the things I love so much about sports. You mentioned that your kids are playing. Your son, Caden, is a BYU tennis commit and ranked the number one tennis recruit in the state. How does it go when you two face off against each other, you and your son, Caden? <laughs> well, not well anymore. <laughs> But he actually just received the number one ranking in the entire country. Oh, my goodness. And wow. so um, for doubles. And doubles has always been a huge passion for him. And um, singles, he's top 20 and does well. But doubles, he just relaxes and yeah. just feels a lot less pressure and, and loves it. And I think the last time we played um, either a set or a match was during COVID in St. George. And I actually beat him. It was 7-6. However, I will not play him again because he would (laughs) annihilate me now. (laughs) He's um, probably grown, you know, a foot since then. And, I mean, even just I try to hit with him now and I'm standing in the curtain just so that I have enough time and to – to keep the ball back deep and hard enough and aggressive enough for it to be worth his time. (laughs) Um, But yeah, he's just, you know, it's crazy. When I first came into BYU, he was kind of fit in around the bottom of my team. Mm -hmm. And then he, the next year he was in the middle. And then the next year he was at the top. And by my fourth year, he was crushing my best players. I mean, it was, it's just, he just has gotten bigger and stronger and, and smarter. And it's just, you know, it's been fun to see. And, um, you know, the men's game is just a lot different than the women's yeah. game. Mm-hmm. And when you throw in that serve and the power um, that he has now, I mean, I just wouldn't stand a chance. He would he would crush me. <laughs> crush me. And I'm so out of shape that I'd pull a muscle in the first three games and, <laughs> and have to retire anyway. So, so he grew up playing with the tennis team. I mean, you, would you bring him to practice with you? Uh-huh. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the big things when they called me in for my interview was my concern was, I don't know if I can do this because I just don't have time. Yeah. I'm practicing with my oldest three hours every day and we're traveling to tournaments at least twice a month. And I just, I, I just don't know that I would have the time to give him the time and attention he needs. And, um, and gratefully, because I'm coaching girls and he's a boy, yeah. he actually could join in my practices, mm. um, which was awesome because I really couldn't have done both. And um, he came almost every day for the first, I'd say, two or three years. Now it's um, pretty sparse. He'll come maybe once every two weeks or so uh, just because he's got to play guys now. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's just a diff- it's just a different level. Um, but... Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it really did work out really well. And he started traveling to tournaments with other families and it was great. You know, now he's just so social and he can talk to adults and have conversation. <laughs> and I feel like he's ready for his mission. You know, oh. it just helped prepare him. And so it really did work out great. My last question for you is what do you feel like brings you the most happiness and joy as you coach your kids and as you coach the women on the team? You know, I don't want to get emotional, but (laughs) we do it often on the show. You're fine. (laughs) I would say um, just changing lives for the better. Um, Sorry. I love the girls on my team like my own kids. And they know that. And... Because of that, I get mad at them. <laughs> I, I push them. Um, I, uh, I'm hard on them, but they know I care about them. And I'm the same way with my own kids in tennis. Sometimes I'm hard on them and I push them because I know that I know what it takes to be great. Um, and, you know, probably the most fulfilling thing is just Seeing them achieve success, not just on the tennis court, but just in life. Um, You know, not everybody leaves here their last year feeling like it was the best year of their tennis. I know that's everybody's goal and dream. And I mean, just yesterday on the tennis court with my own son, he was frustrated and feeling like, um, you know, he just has been struggling a little. And I just, I said, hey, like... 
right now, just focus on the good. Yeah. You know, let's focus on what's going well and all the good that's happened. And um, I just think sometimes kids get so caught up in winning and result, just result-based thinking. Yeah. And that can be detrimental to their success. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I really try to help my kids and the girls focus on the things that they can control in their lives. And, um, and that just makes the ride and the process and just having joy in the journey every step of the way and not just having joy in the result. Mm -hmm. You know, when you win a tournament, you find joy, but that doesn't happen very often. Yeah. There's 128 players in every single draw and there's one winner. And so just more about just finding the joy in the everyday wins in life and on the court and off the court. And I think we do a pretty good job of that. Um, my assistant and I and as parents um, really just trying to help my kids to to focus on that and realize it's just about the little the little successes, the little wins. You know, it doesn't have to be the one big match on center court at the U.S. Open, you know, but what about everything else? Um that, you know, I had uh, one of my players this year that was having a hard time finding joy, you know, and um, just feeling like tennis just wasn't making her happy anymore. Yeah. And um, and that happens. Yeah. And so it's been really good just to try to help her to see just little things that are blessings in her life. And now, three, four months later, she's happy again on the tennis court. And so sometimes it's just digging a little deeper just to find what makes you happy. Oh, I love that so much. We're here with BYU Women's Tennis Head Coach, Holly Hassler. Holly, thank you so, so much for coming on and sharing your experiences with us, and, and good luck on this season. Thank you. I appreciate it. You can download and listen to all episodes of Her Why on the BYU Radio app or wherever you find podcasts. Her Why is a production of BYU Radio.